Good evening. This evening we welcome um, David Buchanan, better known as the Kilted Chef. David's from Edinburgh originally, but has lived all over Scotland over the years and has been a chef for over 20 years, working in various areas of the industry, from private catering to even founding his own social enterprise project. Currently working as a chef in Mayfair, tonight we're really looking forward to hearing David's culinary story. Hi David, and welcome to the show. Good evening. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for having me on. No, it's always good. And I, I'm a keen fan of food, so I'm always keen to talk <laughs> to a chef. So tell us then, you've got lots of in, um, experience in the culinary industry, but what? how did you end up doing that? How did that end up being your career? Career, yeah. I, I often say um, I've been cooking for 24 years. I'm thinking about taking it up as a career. Um, I, um, I I arguably stumbled into cooking um, and uh, life circumstance uh, changed my uh, my my plans originally were to go and study medicine uh, at Edinburgh University. Um, a combination of factors and life uh, circumstances and events uh, led me to uh, not do that. Um, I have uh, worked in kitchens uh, from about age of 12. Um, I managed to lie my way into my first kitchen when I was 12, turning 13. And um, a couple of weeks after I'd started on my 13th birthday, the chef uh, found out I wasn't just turning 16. And um, in those two weeks, I had managed to prove to him that I was you know whether I was capable or what, whether I was doing the job that he needed done or whatever we were, I was never very sure. Um, but he found out and um, called me out on it and I thought oh no <laughs> and um, so I kind of said so if it's any consolation that's the only lie I've ever told you and it will be the only lie I ever tell you and um, he basically kind of um, put his arm around me uh, became a, maybe a, a mentor stroke uh, father type figure and um, he said, look, you know, you come to me, you work with me, I, I do the wages and the rotas and the scheduling, you work under me, you follow me all the time and, you know, stick in with me and I'll do you right. And arguably that's uh, where we kind of started. And um, here I am some 24 years later, I'm currently sitting in a, in a nice hotel in Mayfair working for, uh, uh, working for a, a wealthy royal client who has a... Um, I would normally say second property, but they probably got about 20. So another, <laughs> another one of their homes here in London. And um, just because of the current COVID situations in different parts of the world where they would normally travel for work and for business and things, um, they have decided to kind of batten down their hatches in London um, because it makes uh, makes more sense for them. Um, so here I am um, kind of uh, on a little uh, COVID jolly, um, hand sanitizing everything I touch and uh, um, enjoying uh, uh, what is, is a really uh, bizarre uh, situation because London is so, so quiet um, mm -hmm. at the moment uh, when you're used to the, the, the normal hustle and bustle. It's a bit crazy. Um, so I guess my journey has been from not studying medicine to kind of defaulting to, to cooking and to chefing, which is quite a, quite a common uh, thing within the industry. You ask a uh, uh, 100 school children who wants to be a chef, We'll probably not find any hands up but statistically probably about 40 or 50 percent of them will eventually have a job in hospitality at some stage in their lives even if yeah. it's just working in a bar or serving tables or something whilst they're at university so um i never regret having not studied medicine I know lots of friends who studied medicine who don't particularly enjoy lots of elements of their lives, not necessarily their jobs, but because of the, the unsociable hours and the, the stresses and strains and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so I've always said that I, I don't uh, I don't regret anything I've done. I, if I did it again, I'd still do it. I'd maybe just do it in a different order. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. And so you've, you've worked loads of different roles. So tell us a bit more about all the different things that you've done and what, what have you really liked doing? What's been the most rewarding for you, the most fun? Um, I, I, I think in, in terms of the industry being a chef, um, I think that um, jobs offer you um, lots of different opportunities. And it can be the case that um, because I started working really young to a very high standard, I started working in a, in a hotel kitchen which had two rosettes, two AA rosettes, which is kind of 
halfway towards a Michelin star. So, it, it, and, and 24 years ago, it was a very, very good marker of quality and, and sort of the caliber of the chefs and, you know, the, the caliber of the produce and it was more local and it was better and all of that kind of thing. So for, for five years of my early parts of my career, I worked to a really, really high standard, um, which a lot of chefs tend to not reach or attain until they're a lot older, maybe in their early 20s, they do college for a couple of years, get a couple of jobs, maybe come to London or, you know, take a job in a Michelin star restaurant or something like that. So the, the trajectories are very different, I think, for different people. And because I started so much earlier, I felt that I had a lot of core skills um, that a lot of chefs now will not have. Um, and, and arguably as well, although I'm, uh, I'm 37 now, um, my experiences led me to be leading kitchens more than 10 years ago. Um, so I've done everything from uh, contract catering. I worked in Kuwait during the, the, the second Gulf War. Um, I used to manage uh, as head chef on a military base kitchen there. and We did 35,000 meals a day. So every six hours, 24, 7, 3, 6, 5, you're doing sort of somewhere between eight and a half and 9,000 uh, troops. Um, and, you know, the volume is just so vast, it, it, it's yeah. virtually impossible to convey it. And not only to not only to do the, the actual cooking part of the job, which is, as you can imagine, by way of volume, hard enough. Um, <laughs> We actually had to build the kitchen from nothing, you know. And I remember one of the early conversations I had with a guy who was an engineer of some sort. And then he said, oh, what do you need? And I said, well, you know, some sort of a structure. And he said, good job, yeah, walls, okay. And I thought, okay. <laughs> and, then, and then he goes, well, we go for a roof. And I was like, yeah, we kind of need a roof. And he was like, good job, roof. And I was like, and then a floor? And he was like, floor, got it. And he was making notes. And I was thinking, what the heck is <laughs> I going to build for me if I don't really give him like the whole thing yeah. so, um, and at that stage I was only about 19 or 20 so um, it was a, a baptism of fire but in my head I've always had a, a great grasp of figures and numbers and whatnot and my argument was always you know I've worked in kitchens where I've been producing you know you know top two reset start standard food probably for maybe 30 40 people in an evening i've done weddings for a couple of hundred doing banqueting in hotels um but i have done big number uh, businesses by way of uk or indeed of scottish standards so 1200 1600 lunches and dinners is a walk in the park to me because i'm used to doing eight and a half or nine thousand every six hours so i had all these kind of skill sets that are quite unique um, even within chefs, um, you know, you'll tend to find someone who can do contract catering, someone that can do Michelin, somebody who can do yachts, someone that can do private houses. But there are very, very few of us who can kind of jump in and out of the mall and sort of alter our skill sets and, and uh, our abilities and, um, and whatnot uh, in real time. Um, so I think the opportunities of each job are very much down to uh, the, the caliber of the person and what you want and what you need from a job. So when you're younger, you're prepared to take a much lower salary, for example, because the opportunity that you might well be gaining in terms of the experience, building your network, et cetera, can be a much greater reward for you than just you know an extra few hundred pounds in the bank at the end of the month, which arguably you probably don't have much time to spend because you're spending all your time at work. So it's only, I guess, as I've gotten older and spent longer in the industry, um, I see the opportunities from a completely different perspective. Um, I'm very lucky that I've worked very, very hard over the years to get to where I am and I always feel that uh, you, your your hard work is always rewarded in this industry. Um, anybody who says otherwise, I, I, I think, is is uh, is probably not working hard enough, <laughs> uh, generally speaking. Um, so I'm lucky enough, um, fortunate enough to have worked hard, earned good money, um, travelled the world very extensively, seventy something countries at last count, um, and arguably being a Buchanan and being sort of staunchly Scottish, I, I, I bought and served and cooked food across the world um, and I, I come back to Scottish produce every single time whether it's Scottish textiles and uh, you know the rich heritage that we have in, in, in Scotland for manufacturing and you know everything from whiskey to gin you know Scotland had a really rich rum heritage mm -hmm. um, I, I kind of have a, a very globalized view of things 
um, because, you know, everybody in the, the modern world, rum is kind of getting a bit of a kind of craft revival. It's going to be the new yeah. craft gin. And, and uh, everyone's like, oh, craft gin in Glasgow, that's new. And you think, well, actually, no, um, we've been making rum in Glasgow for years because we used to have a sugar industry. But then arguably when slavery was abolished, you know, the, it was easier to grow sugar beet than cane. And, you know, and so the, all these parts of history, if you actually look at almost every element of history, there is a very, very rich uh, food and drink heritage there, which I find fascinating because um, I find uh, history actually quite a, a boring subject. But maybe because it was taught to me by somebody who wasn't particularly invigorating. Um, so uh, I always think later on in my years, maybe I'll go and do the family tree and, and, and that kind of thing and, and, and learn a little bit more about the, the practicalities. But sadly, in my world, on both sides of my family, um, we're as Scottish as, as far back as paper uh, begins. And um, I have one, um, my oldest and uh, most uh, recently uh, deceased uh, grandparent. Uh, she was from uh, Weatherby in uh, Yorkshire. Other than that, I've got no story. Whereas in the world I'm in, I meet people that have Panamanian, Venezuelan, um, St. Lucian, uh, London, Spanish, Lebanese, Canadian. And I'm like... <laughs> A job you know uh, and, and, I've, and i've met them in wales or somewhere really obscure you know and um i always think that's quite funny um but I, inevitably we get talking about scotch whiskey and, and scottish food yeah. and often i'm wearing my kilt or or or, or, um, or something i always have my uh my arbit my uh, my harris tweed wallet and then i normally tell them the story of the herring bone and then the the, the, the salmon and all that kind of stuff you know so i could bore everybody for hours on all sorts of things but uh, i need people like you to tell me to stop talking and ask the next question <laughs> oh, no, not at all i'm intrigued it's so interesting and i think that that whole heritage thing you saying you, you, you might go and explore that and i think it does come to you with age doesn't it when you're younger you don't necessarily appreciate where you came from and it's not until you go away and travel a bit and you realize that actually you live in a great place and you've been really lucky and you yeah. have all this history and heritage to fall back on. Yeah, I mean, seven. I, I think I, one of my friends uh, has a daughter, and uh, we sat and counted the countries that I'd been to. Um, uh, arguably not because I can remember them, but uh, she would date, name them, and then I would say yes or no, and then she would tick them or cross them. And uh, I think we got to about 72 or something at one point, and I've probably done a few more since we did that task. And um, I, I think that... Um, being lucky to travel with work um it's a very very different thing everyone thinks oh it must be amazing being in saint tropez or in <laughs> car or the oh, yeah, it's smashing. Yeah, yeah it's smashing you're trapped on a you're trapped on a metal and uh, in a metal box that moves um, and you get to see saint tropez oh yeah it's smashing you know yeah you know you might as well at least when you're at home yes you don't necessarily have um you don't necessarily have the views of saint tropez but you do have freedom uh you can walk wherever you want to and you, well up until about march you could have gone wherever you want to, whenever you want um so it's a different world now i suppose um but uh i think that's uh that's just a perspective thing and uh, i think uh, the older you get the more you kind of realize that you know what money isn't uh, money and things aren't that important and being happy is more important and I think that the I think the world is changing thankfully um, I think it's uh, it's very tough I think for people of my generation because we came from no internet to internet to mobile yeah. phones to arguably now onto 5g devices where where we've never been as well connected but arguably never been so disconnected from the realities of life you know um i love watching youtube videos of uh, like young teenagers trying to use an old dial-up phone <laughs> to get a cassette into a cassette player and giving them a pencil to wind the tape back in you know yeah. like that stuff just fascinates me because obviously I, I've got the benefit of having done it all. But uh, I just like to think that um, maybe one day I'll have children and I'll I'll be able to laugh at them uh, when uh, when they can't figure out how to I don't know how to work a CD player or something. Because I guess yeah. we're migrating even away from that sort of technology now as well. You know. Well, I was explaining that whole phrase of um, here, have a pound and uh, go and tell someone who cares was the give comment. Somebody a and, and my son was like, but why would you give someone a pound? And I was like, a pound? for the phone, phone box. 
<laughs> and they were just, yeah, they just couldn't get it at all. Brilliant. Love it. Then the penny drops. <laughs> you know. Is that oh. what those red box things do? Yeah. Just thought they were for decoration. No. <laughs> Oh. Um, I think I'm about a social enterprise project. Indeed, yes. Tell what so what's it all about and what's it aim to do? So um about um two and a half, it'll be three years in January, actually, next January, um, I set up um vanillaism as a kind of um as a concept. Um we like to think of ourselves almost as a non-religious cult. Um mm -hmm. but one of the, one of the good cults. Um, where we basically, um, as, a, as, a, as a business, we kind of operate uh, like a non-profit. So we basically grow vanilla in Indonesia. I have uh, a few cooperative arrangements with farmers across Bali and across wider um, Indonesia. Um, Indonesia is more than 17,000 islands that compose uh, the, the, the nation. Um, and they're... Um, Basically, they are a developing nation. Um, they historically have always grown vanilla there, um, but like a lot of countries, developing world countries, where they um, they promise the the farmer wild riches, and if you grow it, they will come, and all of this kind of thing. Um, and then, arguably, they get trashed. Uh, they get uh, stepped on from the people above them in the food chain, and. Um, I was approached by um, my now business partner, who's a very good friend of mine, who's an academic who, a bit like me, has traveled the world. Um, although he was born and bred in Bali, um, he's kind of traveled the world as an academic, studied in the US and Germany. And he now lives in Oxford uh, with his wife and uh, two grown up boys. And um, he kind of approached me when I was working. Um, I was working for Will Smith um, in uh, down in Surrey at the time uh, as his private chef, uh, whilst he was filming uh, the Aladdin uh, movie. Um, and um, basically, um, he approached me and he said, "Look, you know, I'm trying to kind of help the people in my village. You know, by growing vanilla. Like, can you help us?" And I was like, "I use vanilla. Of course, I can help you." I have no idea whether I'm qualified to do this or not. Um, but I said, you know, what is it that we can do? So we met for coffee and um, we just chatted through things and stuff. And I said, look, if you can create this product, I mean, there is massive demand for us, a huge global shortage, et cetera, et cetera. And um, at that point, it was just kind of a bit of a sort of pet project idea. It wasn't really, I kind of thought, I'll turn up give them a bit of money, they'll plant some vines, happy days, they'll produce a few kilos of beans every year. You know, I get a wee Christmas present, I give them out to my chef mates and a bit of high-fiving and whatnot. I mean, arguably that's where it kind of started. Um, this year we have just cured um, nine tons of vanilla. Um, so we have produced the sort of the commodity. Hang on a second, I actually have a, have a packet of pods randomly just inside oh. me. So this is a, this is a, oops. This is a cured, sort of finished vanilla bean, this one. And so this um, uh, starts off life. It looks a bit like a, a regular green bean, like an Ari Gover. Um, and then you basically blanch them, and then you begin to dehydrate them. Um, so we started off with nine tons of green beans, and we ended up with just over one and a bit tons of the, of the cured ones. And um, so it's gotten a bit out of hand, would be the best way to explain <laughs> And um, next year, we're on target to produce, I think, somewhere in the region. We're looking at probably curing about 12 tonnes next year, which works out at around about 60 or 70 metric tonnes uh, by way of uh, production. So we kind of, the idea for us was to kind of try and level the playing field uh, for the farmer. And mm -hmm. like a lot of commodities, um, coffee and chocolate and things like that, which are fair trade and all these kind of schemes, which they kind of invent, um, you know, normally for you know, big food conglomerates to greenwash their message to make the, the product that they sell to you sit easier on your consumer conscience and tell you that it's amazing and that they don't use child labor and all this kind of stuff and arguably it's most of it's nonsense i genuinely have, i mean i've, I've traveled the world uh, so many times and, and and i've never really found a scheme that i kind of looked at and thought yeah we could do fair trade or rainforest alliance or or, or whatever um and i thought if we do this we're just gonna have to do it ourselves and just kind of start over um explain to people what we're doing why we're doing it um 
And basically, everybody that's involved in commodity trading just needs a small commission, right? So, you know, you buy the, you grow the beans, you sell the beans, the guy who buys them, cures them, he gets, you know, he makes 20 pence a kilo. And, and so it gets passed on the food chain. But as we all know, if we've ever tried to buy vanilla, um, you can be spending in, in a retail um, sort of setting, you could be spending anything over a thousand pounds a kilo on generally speaking quite low grade beans right mm -hmm. now that thousand pounds the kilo that you pay the majority of that money is not going to the farmer i assure mm -hmm. you irrespective of what message the company is greenwashing and mm -hmm. telling you it's just not true so we decided to set our, our own business up using my network of, of chef colleagues and contacts you know and set up an instagram page and a website and stuff and it's me basically doing everything at this end myself, which is why it's not doesn't look as shiny and polished as it could and should. But we're getting there <laughs> slow and steady um, because, well, we're getting people getting involved in the project who kind of want to get involved for the kind of feel good factor, and and they kind of want to support us and things. And we kind of try and create collaborations with brands. We're working on a soap project at the moment, and um, we're working with a lot of licensed uh, businesses, you know, um, uh, rum manufacturers, gin companies. You know, we're we're looking at all all sorts of applications, breweries, all that kind of thing. Um, and at the end of the day, basically, we want to bring a, a really good quality vanilla product to the market, a much fairer price for the consumer. And basically, all the money that we make, we reinvest back into our, our, our cooperatives and our organization. And we basically start our little model, our little cooperative model again. So it's about three years from the time that you plant a vine from the mm -hmm. time that you can take a uh, that you can take a uh, that you get flowers which grow on the vine and when the flowers grow they have to be hand pollinated each flower which has been successfully hand pollinated turns into a green bean then you have to grow them on the vine for nine months after nine months you harvest you go through the process you end up with something that looks like that a couple of months mm -hmm. later and then so the condition and, and, and things from there so all in from day one to kind of pods in your hand cured um, from your own space you're looking at somewhere between four and five years so yeah. it's a bit like kind of businesses now trying to go organic as, as in far in terms of farms and such like in that you've got to be able to leave the land for two three four years before you yeah. can get certified and stuff which is a massive massive operational cost for, yeah. for for people to not make any money right so i kind of saw the the organic farming structure here in the uk being very similar to bali um albeit we have the the western wealth and riches but you know in, in bali we don't have that but we do have happiness we have hard work we have great people um but they you know they don't have great education they don't have many opportunities and you know i, I always kind of have believed in the adage for years kind of growing up in the uk and living having lived in rural scotland and stuff you know you saw comic relief and children in need and you know you kind of uh, you know you wanted to make money to you know to to charities and things and I, I've, done, I've done that for nearly 30 years, you know, more than 30 years and kind of thought, w w what actually happens? Because, yeah. you know, I know that I may be, I'm maybe not giving enough, but, you know, arguably I've been giving away for 30 years. And if anything, it, it's actually gotten worse, this problem of homelessness and, and, and charities needing money and all of this kind of thing. And arguably most charities and uh, NGOs and such like are fulfilling parts of uh, society, whether it's offering support and counselling to people who need it, who have had as children or maybe didn't have the opportunities to learn and develop the skills so you know people are trying to kind of put back in in bali i mean we struggle to get phone signal you know i mean it sounds quite ridiculous um but something as simple as running you know 500 meters of a cable um could bring connectivity um maybe only dial up internet but you know better than no internet because i remember those days as well um so you know i think that providing um help and support sometimes is not necessarily just giving somebody money i'm a great believer in teaching the man to fish give him a fishing rod you know teach him to fish and then he can manage the fishery and then he can teach the other guys to fish you know the, the idea i think nowadays of charities is that it's it's all too easy just to kind of give somebody some money and kind of feel quite happy about yourself and you know you get the feel good and then away you go and, and that's it and you know it works for both of you we're not really like that and we we say that we're a charity but we're not really we're we, we are business minded 
Um, but the idea for us is to try and provide opportunities for learning and teaching the guys how to grow better and how to get better at doing things. Um, and we basically are only interested in the vanilla crop um, at the moment because of scaling and volume. But we basically promote true polyculture growing, which means that we grow anything up to 10 or 12 um, sort of agro commodity products in the same footprint and they don't compete with each other. So we produce coffee, chocolate, coconuts, bananas, mangosteens, rambutans, nutmegs, uh, cashews, uh, vanilla, obviously. You know, we, we grow this massive and um, amazing uh, wealth of spice and product and things. Um, and what we do is we tell the farmers, look, we're only interested in the vanilla. Whatever else you can grow, sell it, hustle it, do what you want with it, consume it, eat it, whatever. You know, that's just like a little extra bonus. If you follow our sort of guidebook to a T, then you will get good vanilla. And then for us, that has value. Um, and the better the, the pods are, the more money we give you. So we basically pay the farmers about three times the kilo price that they get for their beans. We give them more than market share. We give them um, we give them an enhanced premium for the bigger, better beans because they have more value. Um, and then once we we sell and we complete on kilos sales because we track them, we're the only company in the world that sells vanilla, and every single pod uh, is is traceable back to source, one hundred percent supply chain uh, transparency. Um, and we track that data internally so that we can start to see patterns and see better regions and better people and, and, and things to make it better to share that knowledge within our groups. And we help a lot of other people that aren't in our groups as well. Um, it's about um, it's about trying to help people. And I, when I worked for Will, we used to have lots of conversations and one that really stuck with me early on in my, my employee with him was that our legacy um in life or after life is about what we leave behind it's not about being famous today and, and getting high fives on the instagram today it's about what is your legacy so that in in, in history going forward mm -hmm. people will think that guy with the crazy tartan you know that sold vanilla and barley he was a bit mental but <laughs> now we've got a house and now we went yeah. to university and, and whatever and for me that is infinitely more rewarding than money. Yes. Yeah. So that's fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're obviously you being a chef, you'll be massively into your produce and you and if you've been around the world, you'll have dealt with so many different ingredients. So is Scotland special in that way? Because we we love our food and drink here and obviously we have a great natural sources for all these things. So absolutely. What I can only I can only speak for my own experiences and, and, and I'm very privileged to be in the top end of the bracket. So, you know, when I'm traveling the world, arguably money is never an object. If you need it, you buy it. The boss wants the best always. Um, if you can give a bit of chat about where the scallops came from or whatever, that makes it better. And, you know, I, I kind of have um, in your head, you've kind of got, oh, I go to that wee deli in the West End and I do this and I go there and I, I buy my veg from the wee farm shop. You know, you kind of have that and that's quite localized. And then when you go on vacation, you know, you maybe go somewhere because they do good orange juice in Spain or something like that. Mm -hmm. I have that with food, but across the globe. So whenever I go to different locations, I've got like my fish guy, my butcher, my produce lady, um, my local farmer, the guy that does the great, the great olive oil, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I kind of have this um, crazy Rolodex of all these uh, artisans and people who are passionate about what they do. Um, and I always kind of think one of the things I learned early on in my, my career was that I'm only one man with two hands and I could only do so much in my 10, 12, 14, 18 hour shift. And if you can collaborate with other people within your team or within your network and get them to do something which makes your job easier and the product that you serve better, do that. Don't don't sit at home and think, oh, I'm going to make pies, so I'm going to make my own puff pastry. And, and you know, and, and I love fish and chips. Who doesn't? Right. But I'm going to make my own chips. Trust me. Unless you're really proficient at chip making, I assure you, McCain and every other company out there that sells chips is doing it better than you. Trust me, 24 years of doing it, I still buy McCain chips, right? <laughs> but it's about checking that element of your ego where, you know, someone comes around and says, oh, coming around for dinner, we've got steak and chips, you know? 
well, what you know, did you make your own chips? And someone goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I spent uh, three and a half hours this afternoon uh, peeling them, cutting them all perfectly square. And then I probably over over boiled them or, you know, I overcooked them. Uh, so now they're a bit wrinkly. But, you know, I spent three and a half hours doing it. You know, the smart person would have put all that extra time and effort and money into the buying of the steak, getting the right seasoning on it, tempering it before it went into the pan or onto the grill and then bought the chips. You know, but okay. that's a skill. That's a skill that you learn in the industry and in life. I think uh, the older that you get um, and uh, arguably I, I kind of have all of those in uh, all of those kind of food elements in my world as well. Of course, I'd love to make everything that I eat from scratch and know the story behind it. But it's just not practicable when you travel as much as I do. And when you're busy, you know, you lead a busy life, you work and, you know, there's always something going on. The kids, you know, phone calls, all oh, the, the plumbers come in, you know, life just kind of gets on top of you. And I think that we I think that we again, being better connected in this sort of modern world stroke society is not necessarily a good thing. Because we've lost the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker on the high street. Um, there has been a resurgence of the kind of the indie hour um, in, 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 in kind of recent years. Um, I'm a great believer in eating seasonally, um, shopping locally, um, but thinking globally. Um, so eating things within season uh, and not flying strawberries from South Africa or or, um, or South America or something like that, um, uh, just so that we can have strawberries in December. Mm. Taste rubbish. What's the point? I don't really yeah. get it. Um, but that sadly only kind of works if you cook for a living and you really understand food, you know, and the, and the history and the heritage and, and the seasonality of things, right? Um, whereas kids nowadays, strawberries are available all year round. Avocados, you know, you buy an avocado in Tesco for, I don't know, 30, 40 pence, probably not mm. a very good avocado. You probably don't really want to understand its full ecological impact because it's probably quite horrendous. But mm. as a kid nowadays, you want a cheap avocado. I yeah. didn't eat much avocado, I don't think, until I was about 20. Because <laughs> I spent nearly seven years cooking before I tried my first avocado because they were blooming expensive. They were about six or seven yeah. quid each when I yeah. when I first started cooking. So, you know, it's, it's funny how you see these global trends in food migrating and whatnot. And, and global food policy um, is, is really wrong. All governments across the globe maybe with the exception of Italy, Spain, maybe most Mediterranean countries, they kind of had the seasonality thing and they kind of got that cracked. But anywhere else in the world that does not have a particularly warm climate, when you're dependent on importing goods, even in the summer times and such like, um, you realise that um, the quality of what you're eating is actually not very good. Um, and, and Scottish produce is amongst some of the best in the world, if not the best in the world. We need to be more frank about, you know, and be a bit more honest about what we eat, uh, what its impact is. It's vast. Um, most people have no concept now that chicken nuggets or something come from a farm, you know, they you ask kids now where does meat come from they say tesco so well, you know i mean they, they they have no they have no real concept of uh, of farming agriculture or anything like that and arguably the problem that we have now in the modern world when it comes to food especially with our children is that um i'm a, a young single guy uh, in my late 30s who can cook clean uh, and be pretty much self-sufficient and and a bit OCD for cleaning and everything else as well. So I'm I'm in a very very small bracket if you look at you know men of my sort of demographic, um, and people who are not in my demographic, i.e. those who can't cook and you know have to buy you know pre mashed potatoes in the supermarkets and such like. Those people are having children now. If your parents don't cook and can't cook. You're not going to be able to pass that on. We don't teach it in schools. Jamie Oliver's campaigning for goodness only knows what and gone, arguably gone nowhere, bless him. Um, lovely guy. Met him a few times. Uh, he's a pal of a client of mine. Um, but, you know, he's only one man with two hands. And, you know, he's got, I don't know how many millions of Instagram followers. If he can't fix it, what chance have I got? So I, I think that we, we need to all be a bit more frank and a bit more honest. And we have to be prepared to pay for quality. Um, not just pay the highest price and expect it to be the best quality because that metric is not the same. You know, people always ask me, go to the supermarket or go to the deli, go to the store, what's the best carrot chef? And I always say the freshest one. 
doesn't matter whether it's the Tesco Blue Stripe or whether it's the, you know, the, um, the, the Waitrose Taster's Choice or whether it's the organic from Whole Foods. It doesn't matter. It, it's arguably it's, it's, um, it's, it's nutritional value as a fuel source, which is how I kind of uh, look at food in, in, in that kind of way now, um, is how fresh it is. You know, if you buy organic produce in the supermarket, it's always at least a week old because the companies that actually pack the produce will only do that maybe once, possibly twice a week, because the machinery that does it all and everything has to be cleaned between batches because of the organic certification process. Mm -hmm. So if you buy organic carrots on a Monday in Tesco, even saying they got packed on the Sunday, it was probably the previous Sunday. So it's at least a week old. You know, people think, oh, I buy my carrots fresh from Tesco. People just have no concept. Wow. I bought apples today in Tesco. Yeah, you bought apples from South Africa or from Australia. You bought pink lady apples from Australia. Yeah, they would have come from the harvest probably in February or March in in the sort of Australasian uh, sort of calendar. Yeah, because they're they're the opposite hot and cold to us by way of seasons. So they're kind of going into their autumn at that point, and they obviously have to harvest before the winter. They they harvest. They put them in massive warehouses and gas flush them to prevent them from uh, spoiling over the winter time so that they can fly apples here for us to eat them out of our seasons. And, you know, the, the ecological impact on that for everything and everybody is vast. But you buy your Pink Lady apples from Tesco and they say that they're organic and they're extra juicy and whatever else. Your concept of what a fresh apple is is, is so far away from the reality. It's frightening. And so many people are just so clueless to all elements of, of, of this when it comes to food in terms of how it's produced, how it's shipped around the world. And arguably the value of that product whilst you, when you eventually consume it is, is next to negligible. You get the, the pony carrots, that's what I think. That's it, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, they're the best. Yes, I'm married to a farmer, you see, so I, he, he would love to speak to you about all these things. Preaching to the choir, I do apologise. I wasn't briefed about Not at all. all. <laughs> no, no, it's really interesting. It's really interesting to hear it from a chef point of view because, yeah, well, we talk about it all the time. And, and we're really lucky live in a really rural area. We have, still have a travelling butcher who uses local mm -hmm. produce we have a veggie box delivered and that's all local stuff and yeah yeah, yeah. It, it's, it, it really has to be nowadays if you kind of want to live like the olden days let's call it olden days for the youngsters out there listening um, <laughs> or rather, um you know the, the, the idea is that we by having so much choice available all the time that's somehow better yeah mm -hmm. I know Wrong. it's not, is it, it when I look back to... It's, yeah. it's the paradox of choice. I, uh, my primary school, um, there was a kid in my class um, whose dad um, owned the local ice company that used to do all the crushed ice for all the fishermen and all the boats uh -huh. and stuff. Uh -huh. So he would do, like, I guess he was support services or something, I guess, to the fishing industry. Um, and that was in Wick back in ooh, late 80s. So it would have been about 80, 88, 89 kind of onwards for about six years. And um, I always remember fondly spending lots of my time on the farm, chasing chickens, uh, running through fields of goodness only knows what, um, you know, just kind of, I don't know, just kind of eating dirt and things like that we don't do nowadays. Um, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not bad for you, uh, arguably. So the burning question then, do you cook in your kilt? Um, not at the moment, but yes, I do. Um, I, for many, many years, uh, whilst traveling um, extensively through France and working on mega yachts and things, I normally always take a kilt with me. Um, I always just think it's a fun thing. Um, it starts conversations uh, with people who you maybe wouldn't, probably wouldn't ordinarily speak to you or maybe wouldn't want to approach you. Uh, I normally have the big dark panda eyes kind of falling asleep drinking an espresso or something like that that's kind of my normal travel look um that's when i'm on holiday so you can imagine what i'm like <laughs> when I'm working. Um, but uh, i think that, that um i think it's a great sort of talking uh, talking point a good focal yeah. point for people um and inevitably um inevitably uh, people always want to know what you're wearing underneath um and i always tell them or i, I had very many stories over the years you know for men and for women or whatever but now I have the homogenized 
you're welcome to check, but I'm not paying for the therapy. <laughs> so <laughs> that kind of encompasses all. Uh, and then they so don't know what to do. <laughs> that's it. It kind of puts the onus back on them, and you can kill, still kind of stand there drinking your drink or eating your croissant, um, and then they kind of, then they start, you can tell that they're thinking it through. Arguably, I've been I've been accosted uh, any number of times over the years. I have a couple of great stories. I was in Indonesia. I was in Bali in uh, February this year. Really good friend of mine likes a whiskey. Who's a mate of a mate of somebody that knew me. Oh, come and have a beer. All right, no problem. Went for a beer. Oh, we're going to this thing. We're going to this live music thing. You've got to come. I'm like, sure, whatever. Um, so it turns up at some club in the middle of nowhere and it's like outdoors indoors and big music stage proper like a proper big stage right um like an audience maybe like 600 people right my mate's in the middle of it all and i'm like hey, high five and and so i'm wearing my kilt because he told me to get there and he goes all right let's let's go this way so he starts leading me away from where the music was and he leads me backstage and as it turns out he's the manager for all these bands right and he knows everybody and he's like totally the guy right and i'm just in the background going hello uh where my kilt just as you do and i, I was sat and blethered away to this guy who i didn't know from adam but being scottish and i chat to everybody blethering away he's drinking whiskey i'm drinking whiskey we're having a great night um i'm quite bemused at the whole thing everybody wants a picture with me great no problems and I'm just sat there quite, as you like, talking to who I assumed was his girlfriend, but I didn't actually, never actually asked. I was chatting away to her, and just at one point, he just lifted my kilt and flashed me to the entire room. And, I, and you know that way where you're not, well, maybe you don't know, but you're not really that wary because everything's quite light and airy anyway, generally. And then it was even more airy, and I didn't know what was going on. And I, I kind of turned around, and I kind of turned around, and the entire room of people was just aghast. And I was like, what are they all? Oh, and then, uh, yeah. So um, that, that night, um, somebody else exposed me probably to about 40 or 50 people. Um, <laughs> thankfully, we weren't on stage because it probably would have happened there in front of everybody. Um, but yeah, now I'm the guy um, that wears the kilt but doesn't wear anything underneath it. Famous. So is it a Buchanan kilt then? Um, so yeah, that was my that's my chef Buchanan uh, kilt. So I um, I designed my tartan uh, about three years ago, I think now two and a half, maybe three years ago, and um, went through the process and and um, everything from thread count to colours and things. That every part of the of the chef Buchanan tartan, which is obviously protected, registered with the, the tartan authority. Um, wow. It is, um, it's kind of there, um, uh, I guess, for kind of posterity. Um, it's protected, so it can't be used. Um, it can't be used for uh, by other companies without my express written permission. So when you create tartans and you register them, either they are sort of a public tartan, which can be used, or you take the private box, and if they want to, they have to have your permission. And that's basically the route that we went down, um, because I already noticed that uh, there were let's let's leave let's leave them nameless, um, but a shameless group um, had actually been advertising my tartan for sale uh, on their website um, to all and sundry, uh, and I I made a very angry phone call to somebody probably getting paid minimum wage who didn't deserve to have to get me on the phone that day. Um, but I, I have seldom been angry in life. Maybe three or four times in life I've been angry. And that day I was, I was that color of red. I was fuming. I was actually shaking. I was so angry the adrenaline was pumping. And um, they promptly took me off their website and uh about three days later i calmed down um <laughs> but uh it was more the sheer audacity and then i kind of thought about it and i thought i mean it's really nice but i just it was more the way that they did it um if they had asked me i would have been more than happy to have collaborated or or or, or whatever with them um but it was just the sheer uh, blatant face cheek of it and i hadn't even launched it um as my as my own i'd, I'd had it spun and it had it protected and there was a kind of protracted back and forth because we were trying to name it. So we were going to call it the Kilted Chef Tartan. Mm -hmm. And um, long story short, woman in the Tartan Authority, let's leave her nameless, <coughs> Elizabeth. Um, 
her name wasn't Elizabeth. Um, <laughs> she um, she said, well, th th there's another kilted chef. And I said, yeah, but is there a kilted chef that looks like that? You know, I mean, I'm quite, you know. So anyway, long story short, um, we opted for Chef Buchanan. So then I had to buy chefbuchanan.com and uh, <laughs> change my Instagram handle and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that kind of tied it all in nicely, but um, there's a few like, nice little touches in there. There's a little kind of uh, salt tire that's in there, and the blue and the white stripe um, are for um, the, uh, my first nephew. Um, so he's in there, um, and then there's just lots of little fun things. The set size is really big. Um, if I remember rightly, it's about 13 inches uh, set yeah. size, which is yeah. very unusual uh, yeah. in, in modern tartans for the repeat yeah. and to make things more profitable and whatnot. But we wanted something quite striking and, and, and something quite different. Um, it's kind of it's a little piece. Of, I guess it's probably the starting piece of my history if I think about it in that kind of way. So we're looking at trying to collaborate uh, with a few people uh, using the actual uh, fabric itself. Um, we may look at making some face masks and donating them uh, to local uh, Queen Elizabeth Hospital um, if I can get the logistics right and things. Um, sadly, face masks and um, such like have become very uh, trendy and very on point at the moment. And almost every wee woman with a uh, with a sewing machine is very busy uh, until about 2029, um, judging by any of the Instagram uh, responses that I have had. So um, we're looking at options and things. If you indeed know anybody out there who wants to roll together some cushions or something funky and interesting, then by all means, drop us a line, and I'd, I'd love to be part of. Yeah, I'd love to be part of a part of a collaboration or a story, or you know, allow somebody the opportunity to to kind of tell the Chef Buchanan uh, history or the story of something to do with vanillaism or something like that. I think that the. I always believed in the three degrees of separation um, sort of concept. And then having traveled the world, I've literally been to the back end of nowhere and met someone who knows somebody that I know. And I'm just thinking, it's not three degrees. It's quite literally one degree of separation. And that's excluding social media and Facebook and things. Because I, because I travel so much, I go to all these crazy places all over the world. And, oh, yeah, you know John. And, you know, oh, you know Steve. And before you know it, you've got mates all over the place. And, you, you know, everyone has a lovely time. So it's one of the great things about the yachting industry and about being in, uh, being in my world um, is that, you know, the, the number of clients now are much greater than, than there ever was. There are a lot more rich uber rich people you know i work for billionaires so it's it's hard to explain to people that don't know what i do um the the, the disparity between being a, a lottery winner and being a billionaire the the, mm -hmm. the wealth difference is so vast and um, it is it's it's almost incro uh, incomprehensible for a lot of people um so i i i think that um Whilst there are more rich people, there are more jobs. Um, I would say that people like me, who are kind of at the very top end of their game, are in very short supply. Um, if if it was a pyramid, I mean, I would be in the very very top um, percentile. Not because I'm good, but because I'm expensive. So <laughs> again, the the cost value matrix has it's to be the two go together. <laughs> well. And I, I do like to accept compliments now because for about 20 something years I was incapable of, of doing so. Um, <laughs> but um, nowadays I think um, I understand that uh, that it's all about the team and it's about it's as much about people like your husband um, going out there and doing that because if he's not doing that, what I do on the plate is virtually mm. impossible. And, and I think that the, the, the provenance of, of, of what we eat and how we eat it and, and whatnot nowadays, I think, is, is, uh, is only going to become more and more important. And do you see yourself continuing to travel and be all around the world or do you think you're going to come? Ooh. I'm going to come back home to Scotland or the burning, the burning question so the house that I or the flat that I have in Glasgow um, I've owned for 10 years and I've lived in it for about going on three we think um, uh -huh. in France for three years lived in Qatar for three years um, and then traveled the world for another year out of that um, I think that my plans at the moment are to look at downsizing my world um, I am looking to sell my house in Glasgow and um, I'm looking to kind of realign my world and assets and things. Um, the Getting my house sold, once my house has been sold, I'm going to get a dog. 
because I believe that that will make me have to commit to a, a more regular life stroke world. Yeah, um, awesome. And um, my my next plan and project, which will eventually be video blogged and everything time lapsed and whatnot, mm -hmm. is I'm looking at building uh, a tiny house uh, trailer type project mm -hmm. to live in, um, which can move. Um, which I will travel um, the UK, possibly the wider world. Originally, the idea was to build something and drive it to Bali. That was the original plan, but COVID is kind of carried kind of yeah. off. So what we're doing is we're building accommodations in the village in Bali, and then here um, we're going to build the tiny house. And what we're actually going to do is build this little tiny house, which can basically be a portable, towable restaurant. And what we're going to do is take it around little tours um, of different parts of the UK. Um, maybe we'll go and do like the North Coast 500, something like that. Do like two or three weeks doing that, um, stopping there for a couple of days, moving on to the next place, meeting the local farmer, the local fisherman, whatever, local beers, breweries, products, whatever. Yep creating nice little kind of food and drink experiences. Everything's kind of du jour. Everything is just within, you know, as, as small a radius of where we currently are. Um, so park up and use the use the natural beauty of the view that you have as the kind of the backdrop. Um, quick, simple food. It will just basically be me havering garbage to you whilst I prepare and serve you different courses get you well libated as well um and then yeah kind of kick you out and um a little kind of self-contained sort of six eight cover restaurant that we can take around and, and and use um you know use as a kind of teaching space you know maybe teach some kids in some local schools during the daytime and maybe drag their parents in in the evenings that kind of thing um and I think the idea for me is to kind of try and uh, alleviate um, almost all financial pressures and burdens. Um, I, I'm going to be mortgage free by the time I build this uh, this house stroke business, which can also be let out as an Airbnb and stuff. Um, it's going to be all the eco credentials, so it's going to run on solar power, um, uh, lithium batteries. Um, you know, it's all going to be kind of built to the highest eco standards. Um, it's going to be timber construction. I'm going to try and do a lot of the build myself. Um, the aim eventually maybe is to is to kind of uh, maybe to try and sell them as a kind of business as a revenue stream perhaps um so that's kind of what my future uh my near future holds yeah. i'm currently held hostage here in mayfair um because apparently i do really good um cinnamon rolls um as per yeah. breath today and my banana bread which we started because we were wasting a lot of bananas um has been getting massive plaudits both from all of the children in the house some of the staff um, some of the visitors and contractors, um, the reception staff in my hotel that I'm staying in, they seem to get an overspill. Um, they poured some scones and some cloth cream earlier. Um, yesterday, they got some leftover macarons. Um, the day before, they got some brownies and some gingerbread loaf. Um, so I just kind of go through this perpetual baking state mm -hmm. where I make a cake and I have to make a big enough cake to make a cake. And it's got to look good on the pedestal or on the plate or the platter. And inevitably, you know, I don't have that many guests in the house, but you can't kind of put out a third of a cake. It looks quite miserable. So you've got to put the whole cake out and then you can bring it down the next day and you redress it and you can then move it about a wee bit and put fresh berries on the top and a wee bit of whatever. And, you know, the second day you can dust with icing sugar because now it looks different and fresher. Um, and then day three, it goes in the garbage or it goes to staff, it goes to whoever. Um, and then we replenish it and replace it with something else. And inevitably, you make gingerbread, they ask for banana loaf. You make brownies, they ask for banana loaf. Whatever way you do it, it will always be wrong. So you just kind of suck it up and uh, say, absolutely, you can have that tomorrow. Um, always try and play for time. And if you can do it later in the day, then perfect. Um, but yeah, that's kind of um, that's kind of uh, that's kind of what I've been up to um, in the, for the last month. Uh, I'm probably here for another month, um, uh, sort of uh, keeping myself busy here in London, and networking with a lot of chefs. Um, I think we uh, I think we're on this kind of cusp at the moment where we all really kind of need to pull together. And and and, and it, you know, during lockdown um, in the earlier days, um, I was just kind of you know cooking for friends and neighbours. My next door neighbour, the glamorous Pamela. 
Um, she's a, she's a key worker. She works in telecoms, so she's helping keep your phones all working and all these big systems of you know government businesses and organisations and all that kind of stuff. So um, uh, I was doing a lot of cooking at home, doing daft little videos for the Instagram, taking requests from friends. Um, making cakes and all sorts of things and then divvying them up to neighbors and, and all sorts um, and then I was uh, I baked um, for the Queen Elizabeth um, hospital in Glasgow and Govan um, I was just doing like cakes and bakes and things every other week um, a friend of mine uh, from my yoga class um, her sister was kind of like managing like a kind of breakout room for staff and colleagues and stuff so I was just baking some cakes and things at home and she was delivering them and all that kind of thing so just kind of trying to pay it forward try and help others who are possibly less fortunate um, you know I think that um, I've always been a great believer in stopping and giving people your time um, you know saying hello um, you know, if you can help somebody, then I always try and do my best to to, to, to help somebody um, if it's in my remit, if it's in my time scale and, and, and things. Um, I'm mindful that, you know, I'm not always able to do everything that I would like to. But I always kind of like to think that if I kind of make some extra time and try and help somebody today, donate some scones to my uh, hotel reception staff, bit of morale boosting down there. Um, you know, I think it's just, I think it's the kind of kindness that has been lost from the world. You're different. You're, you're a farmer's wife. So, you know, you, you're, 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 I, here, I don't know why I'm talking about spawn making whilst you're sat there. No, you no, should be, uh, no, no, you should be, you should I'm be not a good tutorial or something. I think we, maybe we're going to need to do a little cook along together. Um, you can show me a few things, but um, you know the, the element of you know making a, a batch of scones or a, a bit of cake or something, and, and, and popping some round to the neighbour, arguably has been lost from the big cities and things, and and, and yeah. that's just modern world now, isn't it? Sadly, I mean, I live with you know the house I'm working in is probably worth about two hundred billion pounds. You know, I, I couldn't tell, I literally couldn't tell you the name of the guy I work for. And the, 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 the house next door, like, I literally couldn't tell you whether it was a guy, whether it was a family, no clue, no concept. But again, in the modern world, sometimes that works for these kinds of people. They value their privacy. Um, they don't want to um, they don't want to be seen to be seen. You know, they just they, they, they like their privacy. They like the time to themselves and their families. And, you know, their priorities are, uh, are, are, are lovely to see, um, you know. Um, so for me... Um, it's been a, a bit of fascinating uh, lockdown um, beginning end and all that kind of stuff. I've been home chilling. I've literally done, I've not done as little as this in a calendar year, probably cumulatively in the last six or seven years as I've not done this year. Um, so it's allowed me to focus on things. You know, we did a lot of vanillism, activism at the early part of lockdown, giving out um, free vanilla to people, just be like, on Instagram, like, oh, hey, I saw you were making some cakes. You look like a student. You know, you want some free vanilla? Here, give it a go. And that's basically what we did. Um, you know, we had orders um, stacked up and ready to go. Yachts in the Mediterranean season, just kind of leaving shipyards, getting ready to go and pick up guests. And everything kind of got cancelled. So I ended up stuck with, you know, a few kilos of vanilla that I purposely bought for clients to a spec which then they're bigger and better than every other, you know, nobody else wants the pods that size because they're so expensive. So, you know, I kind of ended up kind of snookered a wee bit and I just thought, you know what, start punting it out. So I started doing that and we managed to develop a, a little kind of cult following. Um, I think eventually our torch paper will be lit, hopefully, um, sort of Christmas, New Year time this year. We're hoping to maybe do a little crowd funder, maybe do some, uh, some crowd funding sort of rewards. So, pods for a pound that sort of thing if you if you donate some money and we'll, we'll, we'll reinvest that into the village um, to build some uh, accommodations which we'll use as kind of airbnb properties um for for visitors to the to the vanillaism jungle to the orchards um and then you'll get some vanilla for free um and then we're kind of looking to try and uh, just do a little fun collaborations you know good well thank you very much I think we've covered a whole range of subjects I never expected to cover. It's been really interesting. Thank you. Indeed, thanks for uh, thanks for having me on. Um, happy for anyone to get in touch on the old uh, Chef Top You Can and Instagram if you have any burning questions on yeah. how to design your own tartan or anything uh, anything else. Feel free to give us a give us a follow. I'm I'm quite active on socials. I'm quite responsive on socials. I'd like to think um, mm -hmm. I'm not like 
deluged with uh, tartan inquiries, but you never know. Um, but uh, no, I'm, I'm always happy to um, to get out there and to kind of collaborate and get involved with anything. If I can uh, offer my uh, my experience, my knowledge, my expertise to anyone out there, especially charities, people who, who want to do something similar to what we've done with vanillaism, people who want to buy vanilla, people, you know, anything like that at all, just get in touch. Uh, I'm only too happy to, uh, to, to, to field calls. Um, Instagram is probably the easiest way just to reach out to me. Um, but other than that, I look forward to following. Uh, it's the whole month we're doing Plan Buchanan, correct? Yes, that's correct. We're celebrating the whole month, yeah, the whole of October. Good so, Good. thanks for your time. Have a have a great month. You too. See you later.